God, I don't know there's that many people here this morning. What do you think? <laughs> I'd like to thank Jim G for taking good care of me. We didn't overeat, but we came close to it. Uh, food was very good, and the room was very nice, and you all have been very nice, and Jim B. and Don, and Harry, of course. We probably, it's good we never got together. <laughs> good to be with Ted again. And Ted and I have known each other for many years, and we've talked about June a lot, and it's so nice and sweet to be with you last night. She sponsors a girl in our group. We have a girl that was smarter than everybody else, so she had to go to California to get a sponsor. <laughs> it happens, you know. <laughs> and she's better. Thank God for that. <laughs> Group's glad, too. Everybody's glad. Everybody's glad June got in the picture. Well, I don't know how June's going to be, but Sherry's better. I am Jim Williams, and I'm an alcoholic. Good to be here. Good to be here. It's a good place. You got good AA here. Not that way over. And I thought it was nice of you to let me come from 98 degrees to 70. Enjoyed that very much. 50 degrees in the morning. No wind. We have wind where I come from. You see mosquitoes, but they're. <laughs> We don't let them hang around. We blow them out of there. <laughs> What's that new deal? That new deal where you have to have sex all the time? Um, codependency. <laughs> God, I wish I'd have thought of that. I wonder why in the hell I didn't think about that. <laughs> you know, if I'd have thought about that, I'd have been making so much money, I'd just sent one of my boys up here. <laughs> Wouldn't that have been something? Can you imagine that? God, God. Chuck Chamberlain years ago used to say, What controls you? Codependency. Why in the hell didn't I think about that? That's what it is. And what's good about it is everybody's got it. <laughs> Doesn't make any difference who it is. Everybody's got it. You can make a fortune out of codependency. What in the world didn't I think of that? Isn't that? I've been thinking about this since I'm late and didn't think about it. What if we had a quick fix? Like a fast food thing. Fix you on the way home. Just a drive through. <laughs> we could get a chain of those going. Here we are, right? We go to Hazleton, tell them how we are. They write it down. Put it in a book. And we buy it because we identify with it. <laughs> <coughs> I told my sponsor, I said, are we that sick? He said, yeah, we're that sick. <laughs> and this other deal where you have to have parents to make you be alcoholic. Uh, if you don't have that, you got it. It's, uh, uh, your parents are malfunctions. What? No, dysfunctional. <laughs> Can you imagine an alcoholic calling someone dysfunctional? <laughs> We're the only ones that always function properly. <laughs> Too bad about parents and stuff. They just didn't function right. God, I can't believe we fell for that sh uh, stuff. We'll fall for anything. We'll just fall. What do you think? We've got a clear theft program. Watch it on. Toenails. Let's go. <laughs> I've got them, you know. <laughs> just anything. What is it? Well, I'm in the place that's going to save me from everything I've ever, going to give me everything I ever looked for, everything I could ever hope for, everything I could ever wish for, everything anybody looks for, people that spend thousands of dollars to find it, I've got it, now I want something else. And that's the way I am. We really don't need to be that sick. We're sick enough anyway. Why, why should we improve on it? I like self-help books. They got a bunch of oh now we're we're making things so damn popular it's unbelievable. People are making fortunes out of us. We're going we're not doing well, but the people are doing good with us. And go in there and says, 
That was a place where they had a bunch of little AA and the rest of it was self-help stuff. And this guy was talking to me and hadn't done real well for 12 years. I said, look at those books. He said, oh yeah, i got a room full of them. I said, my God, go get rid of them. He said, why? I said, "That's ex- you're trying to build up exactly the same person you're trying to get rid of. <laughs> my folks were not going to raise me to be an alcoholic. I don't know why, but they did not want me to be an alcoholic. In fact, it never entered their mind for me to be an alcoholic. They thought I should be a Southern, Southern Baptist. You know, we're the ones that pray for the Catholics. <laughs> well, they drink, you know. Episcopalians, they just got tired of being Catholic. Presbyterians, they knew it was going to happen. And the Methodists, they just didn't like water. <clears throat> I think I'd like to have been a Lutheran. They believe in doing everything just a little bit. I was raised in a little town out in northwest Texas. In Texas, you got 254 counties, and 250 of them are dry, which means they don't do nothing. You don't drink, you don't think about it, you don't buy it, and we don't sell it, and you can't get it. You have to drive to get it. you got to go to bootleggers to get it. And they have a guy standing up there just like me, says, if you think it, you might as well have done it. Well, hell, I knew I must be thinking it. I didn't know what it was, but I knew I must be thinking it. Finally got to be about 13, which will happen to you if you do what I was doing one day at a time. <laughs> and one afternoon I got in the car with this girl, and we slipped out in the country a little bit, got the best around, and I got those funny feelings. They said, we've been, I told them about it. They said, we've been meaning to talk to you. See, I knew they had. You know we've been praying for you. You know, it's not like AA. A said, so old Jim lay in the ditch last night. If he lives, we'll get him. And this bunch, they hone in on you. They see that gleam in your eye and they say, oh, he's getting ready to think he thinks he does it, we'll lose him. So what you got to really do is watch them or they'll get you. And so when I told them about it, they said, meet us before, meet, you come and meet us before the funeral or ceremony, uh, service. We got back there in that room and we all got down there and they just prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. Now when they said, now when you get, when they sing that last stanza, you come down that aisle and you get saved. I said, what from? I haven't done nothing. They said, get up and come down there. And I walked down there and it's kind of like a hey, said, don't give out any chips. They hug you and kiss you and tell you how great you are and you know you're not, but hell, I liked it. Then they throw you in the tank and the hangs just leaks and you choke a little, but you come out all right. Went to school the next day and saw that girl, came right back. I said, well, we're going to have to do it again. It didn't take. They said, no, you just don't do it. Well, they didn't know. I didn't know how to don't do anything. I didn't know. I didn't know how to don't do anything. I didn't know that they could just say, don't do that. They don't do it anymore. I said, well, how do you don't do it? Don't think about it. I said, I wonder why I didn't think about that. I thought, well, I'm two o'clock in the afternoon. I'll just go ahead and think about it the rest of the day. When I get up tomorrow, I'll just never think about it again. Got up the next day and thought about it more than I ever thought about it for my life. I had no idea that I'm the kind of guy when I start not to do something, I'm going to do it all the time. And when I start not to think about it, that's all I'm going to think about. I used to try to wake up real quick before I thought about it. <laughs> Finally got out of high school. Had to go to summer school to get out of high school. I don't think I was so dumb. It's just that I was always busy. A you know, guy walked by the car and he said, I spoke to you yesterday and you didn't even speak to me. And I said, I was having a meeting. He said, there wasn't anybody in there but you. I thought, hell, how many do you need? <clears throat> Thirty miles away was a town that was wild and wicked. And I heard about it. They had beer joints, honky-tonks. And I told this guy one Saturday, that's before I knew you could do it during the week. We, I said, let's go over and find out what that's all about. And we drove over there and got one of one of those honky-tonks. And my God, there was that deacon that I'd seen all my life with a warm girl in one hand and a cold beer in the other. I said, my God, let's get out of here. He'll tell Jesus on us. And we didn't even get to do it. You know, if you get caught before you do it, you ought to forget it. <laughs> that guy said, well, he can't tell anybody. I said, well, you got a better shot with Jesus than we do. 
However, he was happier than I had ever seen him. And I like the girl he's with on Saturday night a lot better than one he's with on Sunday morning. I used to think every time then, I said, God, when you see, I'd see him every Sunday morning, he looked sad, and I thought deacons were just sad. Now I know, hell, he's just tired. <laughs> we had two beers, didn't taste good, didn't feel good, and I was glad to get out of there. Next morning, went to church, first time in my life I wanted to go. I thought, I'll bet you that he's old enough to get old enough, you won't have to go. There he was. Sad like he always was. Then I had my first spiritual awakening. Maybe you can do it a little bit and just don't tell anybody. Went back next Saturday, told my buddy not to tell anybody. It's a big town, had two joints, went to the other joint, didn't see a deacon I knew. Didn't commit adultery, would have, but I didn't know much about it. And you know how we are, I think about it all day long and drink a beer and forget it. Or if we do, we don't know where we did or not. And I learned how to drink. Didn't even know I knew how to drink. You just drink one beer right after the other. Get the feeling it's good. Can't feel it all. Southern Baptist not allowed to dance. Learned how to dance. Fell down the dance floor. Busted my nose. Broke it. First, I did it five times after I learned how to do it. Blacked out. Wake up the next morning. Threw up just like I've been doing it for years. <laughs> this guy called me and said, how do you feel? I said, God, I feel horrible. He said, oh, but you had a good time. I said, oh, well. Then I knew how to have a good time. You just go out and get drunk, black out, wake up next morning, throw up, then you know you had a good time. <laughs> Did not know you drank it any other way. I thought people who didn't drink like I drank, don't drink. They, now they're putting umbrellas in them. Get the only rainwater to get in there. <laughs> they were already putting fruit in drinks, not mine. Too much acid is not good for you, you know. <laughs> I'm over at this place one Saturday afternoon about 2.30, and I want to, I'm just walking in town, because I, I want to walk and stay as long as I can, because I put off drinking as long as I can until it gets near dark. So I don't want to get drunk too quick. So I'm walking by this post office, and there's a sign out there that said, We need you. I walked in there, and they did. They said, Have you ever been to California? I said, No. You want to go? Yeah, we're leaving in the morning. I said, God, what do I have to do? Just sign right here. I'm already having trouble. I go with kids places I don't want to go so they like me and they don't like me enough. Somebody always gets my girl. The one that's supposed to be going with me, goes with, she goes with him. And my folks are already saying things like, Jimmy would never want to be doing that. Now, I've already done it once, getting ready to do it again. They'd say, Jimmy wouldn't be caught dead doing that. Wouldn't you be awful to be caught dead doing that? <laughs> Everything they knew I didn't want to do, I want to do. Everything they knew I wouldn't be caught dead doing, that's exactly what I wanted to do. And the things they knew that I wanted to do, I didn't want to do. So I went back and told them, I said, I'm going to California tomorrow. And they said, how are you going to California? You don't have any money. And I said, We're going, I'm going to the airport. We're leaving in the morning. They let me go and look a little funny. When, uh, they're already getting that funny look. So I go back over to this little old town and we went to San Antonio. That outfit really operates one day at a time. And they're a funny bunch. They get up in the middle of the night, make the bed real quick like somebody's coming. Never did. <laughs> then they want to go eat. My God, it'll make you sick eat that time of night, even if you haven't been drunk. Then they're scared because they always walked in groups. <laughs> and whoever it was running our outfit thought we ought to go to take a, take a surprise trip, which means we're not going to tell you where you're going, so you can't tell anybody and nobody will know. Whoever it was running our outfit thought we ought to go to China. We're in the Air Force, so we go to China by boat. <laughs> I think they flew the Navy over and the Marines ran the boat. <clears throat> There's a lot of Chinese over there. Uh, they have some hills and trees and little rice, but they mainly just make Chinese. They, uh, they like it. And they're good at it, and they're not interested in doing anything else. They just, they lose some, but they're making so damn many that it doesn't make any difference. They just... Well, after you're over there about three weeks, you've seen all the Chinese you'll ever need to see. So I told them I was ready to come back home. 
And we stayed two years. <laughs> then we came back by a boat. My folks says, where are you going to school? I said, I'm not going to school. Hate wouldn't be caught dead going to school. Hate school. Never going to school. Couldn't get out of school and went to school. They said, if you don't have that piece of paper, you won't even be able to apply for a job, let alone get one. Every person coming out of that service is going to have that piece of paper. Well, I proved my folks wrong. I gutted that thing straight through three and a half years, got that piece of paper, made sure that I didn't learn one single thing. I made sure, of course, I was going to pass it before I took it, and that it wouldn't benefit a human being whatsoever. <laughs> you know what I like about you and I? We'll go to any length, even if it destroys us, just to be right. <laughs> you know, a lot of people won't do that. A lot of people say, well, I could be wrong about that. <laughs> Not you and I. The only time we'll ever use that statement is when we're damn sure we're right. <laughs> then we might say, well, I could be wrong about that. <laughs> <clears throat> Having some minor difficulties with women. If you put ten pretty girls up there, I'll get the sick one every time. I don't know where I learned how to do that. I see some guys, they just go one girl one night and one girl next week and change girls. You can't do that. You've got to make sure you've got a pretty girl, one that you can take home with, one you can be in love with, for God's sakes. Can't just go with any girl. Take me about two months to find that precious sick little thing. <laughs> then we'd be in so much in love about two months, I'd almost have to quit work. Then they just deteriorate from there on out. When I got the A, I thought, this is the greatest place I have ever been in my life. This is the first time I'd ever been where they had the sick women grouped. <laughs> and I like both kinds. I like the ones who got sick doing it and the ones who got sick watching him do it. seemed like everywhere I worked, they wanted me to come to work on Mondays. <laughs> Monday's my flu day. I don't, I don't have the flu on Thursdays. It's Monday. And for some reason, it seemed to be necessary for us to make sure that all businesses operated properly. That's hard work, that they treat you right, that they're supposed to treat you, pay you right, and then have to run the whole thing. Some of those places that fired me are still operating and doing it wrong, which probably means that most of us are too smart to be in business. <laughs> Finally lost a job, could not find a job. Went every, the way I'd look for jobs, I'd get up every morning, I'd throw up, and I'd spray. I'd go fill out one of those forms and ask you personal questions like, where have you worked the last ten years? Now they their damn business. They even want to know where you lived. I like to move around some. And the people where I live like me to move around some. How are you going to remember all those zip codes and all that stuff? You can't remember that. Now the rest of the blanks you've got to figure out. I wonder what they'd like for me to say. Well, hey, you don't know them very well. That's hard work. Interview lasts about five minutes, then you can get out and go get drunk and do that just one day at a time. I saved this one place because I knew they had an opening, I knew I'd qualify for it, and I knew a guy there would help me get the job, and I knew I'd get it. Walked in there, and there he was, and this other guy was there, and he said, Oh my God, you don't want this job. Yeah, I want the job. i got to have the job. I saved this to make sure this was the place I was supposed to go. He said, you don't want this job. Everybody knew what I didn't want. Everybody knew what I wanted. is always the opposite. Also knew there's something about me he'd like to tell me, but he didn't know how to do it. And also knew they was going to like it better when I left. So I went out, got drunk, waked up the next morning, threw up and sprayed. And I said, you know, I've been doing this for about ten days. I think I'll take the day off. Went out the golf course, and ate no leg, no piece of toast, went around the beer joint where my last spiritual advisor worked. He said, God, you need a beer. I said, oh, man, I'm a Baptist. We don't drink till noon. That's 1030. He said, drink this beer. You're sh I don't want anybody to have DTs out here on the golf course. So I drank half that beer and sprayed the golf course with it. I don't mind spraying if I don't lose my concentration. 
You know, if you lose your concentration, start thinking about women or something, it gets your nose and burns. Then you got to drink the rest of the day just to kill the pain. <coughs> I knew how to meditate before I got here. I don't meditate that deeply anymore. Just me, God, and the commode. And you say, oh God, and it's stringy. And you don't know where the end is. So you can't breathe, you'll get it back. <coughs> so you don't know whether you're going or coming. I know it's even been, this is kind of an after breakfast talk. <coughs> even in the hot summertime down there, you know, when you meditate that deeply, it's tiring. And you'd always just lean over there in that bowl. It's always just as cool. <coughs> I told that guy, I said, I think I better go home and lie down. I didn't get to use those vibrators and those beds till that vibrated until two years after I was sober because I used this vibrator all by myself. And I left to live with me. I was supposed to call on hospitals. I'd get in the car this morning and say, God, I hate to go to that big old hospital, have a hard time finding a parking place. time you find the parking place, you have to take that kit, go through the lobby, down the basement, wind around, go see that person agent. You know him. Hell, he's not going to buy anything anyway. See, you don't even have to park. Just drive right on by. Wait till 10.30, go to the beer joint and said, had another bad day. So I went home and I got in the living room and I thought, what I need to do is commit suicide. Then those guys that didn't hire me will worry about it for the rest of their days. I was living in Houston then and I thought, they'll put in the Houston Chronicle, Jimmy Williams commits suicide and they'll never get over it. But I didn't know how to do it. Now I see it on television all the time. Now, suicide, call that number. <laughs> they probably got pamphlets on softer, easier ways. Join our group. We're losing some, we're gaining all the time. <laughs> I didn't like guns because they make noise. I don't like noise in the morning. And they splatter all over everything. Razor blades were popular then, but I didn't, what, I didn't know what to do. I didn't, what kind of razor you use? Straight edge, double edge. What, which wrist did he cut? All they ever said was cut his wrist with a razor blade. You got two wrists. Which one did you cut? Which way did he cut it? Cut it this way, that way. Nobody to call. I knew you couldn't do it in the living room because you get blood all over the carpet. And I'm always thinking of others. <laughs> so I went to the bathroom, got my old double edge razor, and I, I realized, you know, we're pretty smart even though we haven't done it before. What if I cut the left wrist? Left side die, right side be alive. What if I backed out? thing I need to do is cut both wrists and I can just bleed and die evenly. So I cut both wrists and I'm sitting there on the throne thinking about those guys that are going to worry about it for the rest of their days. And the phone rang. And I thought, what if where am I going I'll always wonder who that was called? <laughs> That'd be enough to run you crazy. <laughs> so I put a band-aid on my wrist right quick. <laughs> Answered the phone, that was the police. You know, police have been trained by ministers. They'll stop you about three o'clock in the morning. They'll say, come go along with me. I said, man, I can't do it. I cannot do it. I've got to get home. I'm supposed to be home at seven o'clock. It's three now. I have got to get up. Then they have a personality change. <laughs> they say, get out of the car. Then you say, by God, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> then they really go nuts and you have to pacify them and go along with them. This guy said, where were you last night? And I said, I was right here. And he said, no, you wasn't. I said, how do you know? And he said, we was there. Then I didn't want to talk to him anymore. I already learned, don't ever talk to anybody no more about where you've been than you do. I said, well, what do you want me to do? And he said, well, I'm going to tell you something, brother. You can either come down here or we're coming out there and get you. I said, well, I'll just come down there. He said, okay, you better pick up an attorney on the way because you're in trouble, brother. And I said, that'll take me an extra 30 minutes, but wait for me, I'm coming. God, I love to live with me. I can live a week and a half a day. God, I've had a hell of a day. Been out the golf course, threw up all over the damn golf course, come back, had an emergency meeting, committed suicide. Now I've got to call another meeting and it's only 11 o'clock. I had $36, which was plenty to start a new career. I just put all my old clothes and stuff. I said, I'll bet you the Lord is trying to tell me to leave Houston. Now, I've been here too long. 
So I threw all my old clothes, clean clothes, dirty clothes, a few sheets and blankets and stuff. Had one piece of furniture, an old lamp, put it on top of everything. Guess I was going to carry the light if I could find the plug. Got in that car and sent the keys to the folks that owned the place. And I took out, waked up the next morning in a little town the name of Brownwood with $7. And I said, well, how my folks are getting along. Yeah, it's amazing when you know it's time to call home. <laughs> so I call them collect so they would know it was me. <clears throat> they said, what are you doing? My famous words. Oh, just out riding around. <laughs> well, why don't you come by and have a cup of coffee? Oh, they will. I never shortchanged my folks. They're not going to get their money back. So I always gave them my very finest story. In fact, I got to listen to it, and it was so horrible, hell, I cried with them. I thought, God, if I'd known it was that bad, I'd left Houston three years earlier. I knew I had to sweat that old John. says, well, Jimmy's honest. Let him have a hundred. Ooh, but a hundred and seven. And you can almost go into business. So I knew I had to sweat that night out. I knew I was going to have to stay there that night, and I knew I couldn't drink, so I went in that bedroom, never slept a bit, and I'd walk, walk, walk all night long. Next morning, as soon as daylight came, I started out. My aunt's already up, and I said, there was one little thing I left out of my story last night. While I was having all that trouble down there in Houston, I was drinking some. But I decided last night I shall never drink again as long as I live. You'll never have to worry about my being underfinanced ever again. I'll never drink again. And they just look at me still funny. In fact, I went back up there after I got in there. I said, do you remember that time? She said, which one? <laughs> she said, well, I remember I turned around to John and said, what do you think? And John says, he's 33. He'll never live till he's 35. So when we saw you leave, we thought it was probably be the last time we'd see you alive. So I didn't know where to go. I remembered that I had helped a guy get a job in the Rio Grande Valley. This was in Fort Worth, where we were. And I thought, I've heard about the Rio Grande Valley has palm trees and all this kind of stuff. I'll just run down there. Stopped right out of Fort Worth. Happened to stop at a filling station and sell beer. And I said, how far is to Waco? And they said, 79 miles. I said, let me have three. Well, you know where the Rio Grande Valley is? It's the end. They got a little creek there. They changed countries. If you haven't found your bottom, it's a good place. <laughs> so I drove drove about ten and a half hours, and there it was. And I called this guy, and for some reason he didn't invite me to his house. There was an old hotel where a drunk ran it, and he got me fixed up with a company trade-out deal, and I got in there for nothing. And I got in there, and I never took my clothes out of the car. Every morning I'd come down that old rickety elevator, go across the street, get my short sock shirt, go back up, take a shower. Did that every day for three weeks. And finally, that place where he worked, they hired me. And then two weeks later, he left. But anyway, they hired me, and the reason they hired me was because I was breathing pretty good. See, people don't go to the Rio Grande Valley looking for jobs. They go down there playing. They go down there snow dodging out of the Midwest. Or they just go down there to shoot birds and have fun. Or go to Mexico. So they hired me, and for some reason, when I could get a new job, I could, I'd work seven days a week and just get drunk and not drunk drunk till I got up into my place. And I figured out what my problem is. I've always been true to one woman. It doesn't work. What I need to do is have number one and a spare. And that's hard to do when you're drinking. Because you'll call number one and say, pick you up about 7.30 and if you're not doing anything, she'll say, fine, might be four or five days before you get by there. So it's hard to really get acquainted. Now, my weekends are like this. I'd get off, I'd work Monday through Saturday noon, and I'd jump in the car and go to the golf course, have a heavy lunch like a six-pack and a cheese cracker, <laughs> get drunk, blackout, be home in bed by 6.30, quarter to 7, wake up 10.30, quarter to 11, go down to my beer joint, close it, 1 o'clock, whoever my best friends were, we'd drive on over to Madame Morris and finish the evening and wait till daylight, and sometimes we'd eat a little way with front chairs and throw it up, and then... Sometimes we missed it. Sometimes we'd drink, and we'd always drink beer Sunday to taper off into Monday, and sometimes I made it, sometimes I missed it. <clears throat> well, this particular Friday, I traded off with a guy that wandered off on the weekend. So I traded off with him, and I'm over at number one's house about 11 o'clock, blacking out. 
And evidently, sometimes we're just too honest for folks. Evidently, she did not know about number two. I evidently had never mentioned it. So I just merely mentioned that I thought I'd drop by to see number two on the way home. And that kind of upset her. So I said, but I want to go to the bathroom first. And she followed me in there. You notice they're putting carpet in bathrooms? That's because you all are having meetings in there. You need to have meetings out there where you've got couches and carpet and beds and soft stuff. Not in bathrooms where they got hard lavatories, commodes, and bathtubs. That's a bad place to have a meeting. So she followed me in there and I'm blacking out so I don't remember what happened. I'm living in an old faded green trailer in an alley behind the motel. I had rock yards a long time before I started putting them in. I'd see those weeds come up there and I said, you'll never make it. And then I'm laying there asleep. I've already learned how to wake up in total fright in my own bed, let alone somebody else's, some other place. And something goes, wham! God, I jumped up, looked down, still had my clothes on. I said, God, I bet I was going somewhere early this morning. And then I looked down there, old white shirt and had blood on it. Blood makes me sick, you know. And they kept beating on that door and you can't get out of those trailers. You only got one door and the window's like that. You can't get out the back. Four knots on my head. A little blood. Uh-oh, I've wrecked my car. Please, I've wrecked my car. I have wrecked my car. Four big knots that big. My forage, all knots. Open the door and a six foot four, two hundred and forty pound Baptist preacher said, Come go along with me. I said, Preacher, I know I look like I'm ready, but I'm not ready. I don't know where the meeting is, but I can't make it. Wherever it is, I can't make it. I'm just not ready. I'm not ready. I just I just can't make it. He said, Get in the car. Got it. I said, I've got to have beer, I've got to have beer, I've got to have beer. He said, There'd be no drinking before the meeting. I got in the car and we drove off. My car looked okay, so I said, I guess I wrecked somebody else's car. <clears throat> so I said, Preacher, I'm going to have to have a beer. I'm not breathing. I'm not, bre- Preacher, I am not breathing. Preacher, I, you got to stop the car. You have to stop the car, Preacher. I am not breathing. Do you know Baptist preachers don't give a damn whether you can breathe or not? <laughs> we drove up in front of her house, so I'm assuming the meeting's going to be there. And I walked in. She did look like she might have fallen in a bush or something. And I went to that bathroom and looked in that mirror, and I'm going to tell you something. She won. I don't know really what happened, but what I think probably happened is I lost my acre ribbon in that bathroom, fell in that bathtub, and she stomped me. Two weeks later, we got married. <laughs> we got married in the First Baptist Church, so it worked. We got married at 10 o'clock in the morning, so there'd be no drinking before the funeral or ceremony. I told her that since she had been married before and I was pure, that it wouldn't be necessary for us to invite a lot of people, but she could invite a few of her close friends. And about 11 o'clock on Friday night, I'm going to be off again on Saturday, I'm blacking out again, so I call my friends. And when I get to the church, she's already there. And I start across that yard, my beer distributor golfing buddy came out of that church and stopped me and said, Wait a minute i got to talk to you. You called me at a quarter of three this morning. We're not here to see you get married. We're here because we don't believe it. And I'm going to tell you something about all of our, your buddies and your friends. The longest bet on your marriage is three weeks. But I showed them. I hung it in there for eight years. But my life changed. I had no idea how nice it was to get up, throw up in peace. Everyone, I was always going to quit smoking because it made me gag up morning. So I'd grab those cigarettes, grab that coffee, and go to that bathroom and lock that door. She'd tell me what I was through that door. Then I'd have to get upset, go make the living, get drunk, come on and tell her what she was, and we did that one day at a time. <laughs> Finally, I went back to that preacher, and I said, Preacher, this thing is not working. He said, You know what's wrong with you? You're missing the beauty of life. I said, Yeah. He said, did you know the fruit trees are in bloom? I said, no. What you need to do is go home and get your wife and drive up the valley and smell the aroma and look at the blossoms. I said, yeah. (laughs) Went home on the door and said, get the car. (laughs) He said, what for? I said, we're going to go look at the blossoms. (laughs) He said, the blossoms. I said, yeah, we missed the whole damn thing. So she gets in the car, and we, I go by and get a six-pack. We start up the valley, and I see a sign that says 14 miles to Matamars. Turn left, go to Matamars. 
switched the keel of blackout, missed the whole damn thing. <clears throat> Lost that job. Could not find a job. Couldn't find a job anywhere. Went for two months completely insane. And if there ever was another guy that drank like I drank, it's this guy. He was just as close to being a good drunk like I was. We were ideal drunks together. And he managed a drug company. So he hired me. Took him about six weeks to ship me to Fort Stockton, Texas. That's west, west Texas. Little trees out there about that high. You can see California on a clear day. He shipped me out there, he said, to learn the drug business. He sent me out there because nobody else would go. I'm supposed to stand in the drugstore, hold this pad, got lines on it, and these pharmacists call this stuff out and I'm supposed to write it down. And you can't do it moving. You cannot do it moving. And that pharmacist kept saying, oh, oh my, son, I kept I couldn't get it, couldn't get it. He said, my gosh, you look like you're going to fly apart. I said, any minute. He said, well, take some of these. And this was really nothing. This was before Valium. Valium, understand, both eyes crossed, you walk straight. <laughs> this is just Libium, which is absolutely nothing. It's just a little two-tone green and black, two-tone green. That's all it is. Really nothing to it. Hell, I took two of them. Nothing happened. I waited 15 or 20 seconds. <laughs> and I'm used to something moving or burning or doing something. It didn't do nothing. So I took three more. Then my knees just went, huh. I said, God, I know how to weave. Now I've got to learn new stamps. <laughs> Everybody's ruined the drug business since then. You, I got it for nothing. You know, I got all I wanted. He used to tickle me out there. He'd say, you know, Jim, I'm a little short of 10 milligrams. 25 be okay? Be fine. <laughs> See, they don't know we don't go by milligram. We just go by size. <laughs> So I took liver in the daytime and drank beer at night. Had one decision to make every night after the third beer, never before, never later. If I'm going to go home early, I'll go get me a pint of bourbon after that third beer, and then I go home. Otherwise, I'll stay on beer and close the joint. I go to home, go home one way and one way only. The only way to go home, blackout. My perfect time was when I blacked out right at the door. Sometimes a little early. Sometimes I'm a little late, but I always drank to that blackout. Good blackout driver. Never had a wreck blacked out. Bad drunk driver. It's on the card what stage I'm in is how fast I go and what I do. If I'm in the right stage, then I can run all the lights. I could even hit stuff that's not even moving. I could. But <clears throat> some guy recommended me for a job back in Houston, hadn't seen me for years, and I went back to Houston in that job, and I set up battle. Me and old what's the name? We were finally had developed such a nice, sweet, deep hate for one another that we really were safe because the one that died first won. But we slept in two different areas because that was safer. And I lasted from March the 1st of 1965 till the day before Christmas Eve of 1965. I played golf with some of these in-laws and customers and their in-laws and oh what's the name and I set up battle and I blacked out at their house and I remember just doing some little something don't know what it was but I remember I did something and I don't know what it was and I did the same thing I've done any time at anybody's house I'd call somebody and tell them I sure am sorry about last night and they would just say, it was okay, Jim, you just got drunk. See, I wasn't sorry about last night. I wanted them to tell me what I did, but they never tell you. Drunk was getting to be a bad word with me. Nobody called me an alcoholic. Drunk, I knew one drunk, and he was the old guy named Bratch that slept in the alley and drank that wine in that little old town where I was raised. And they called him the town drunk. And I'll never, never forget that. And drunk got to be a bad word with me. Guys would say, Jim, I can't have you at the house anymore. We like you, but we can't have you over because you're drunk. Drunk was getting to be a bad word. And that morning I did the same thing, and they told me the same thing. You know, what's your name? <coughs> I'd gone next door, they're getting ready to have a uh, Christmas Eve party. This was on Christmas Eve. And I called in a group. I don't know where I knew her in a group. 
must heard on radio. The reason I like to see you got an intergroup. Because I must have heard it on the radio, and all thing I did, I uh, evidently heard about Alcoholics Anonymous. So I looked under Alcoholics Anonymous and called in a group. And the girl acted like she's glad I called. I should have known then I had the wrong number. <laughs> she said, somebody be right out. Well, hell, I waited an hour. Nobody showed up. Looked in the ice box, and it's 10, 15. They had three beers. And I said, I'll just call them and tell them I don't need them. About that time, the phone rang. And the guy said, be right there before I can tell them I didn't need him. Hell, he hung up. He came by himself because his wife was managing these apartments when we moved in, and he used to watch me going back and forth in 7-Eleven and saying, if he lives, we'll get him. So he came by himself, and I looked out the window, and she's gone next door, and he got a book under his arm, and I said, oh, my God, we're going to read that book and pray. I've not only been baptized, I've been rededicated ten times. I said, just get rid of him. He came in, we didn't read the book, we didn't pray, I don't know what all he said, or what I said, or anybody said, about that time, oh, what's her name, came back, and he said, you want to go with me? Well, I didn't, but it's better staying with her. So I got in the car with him, and I knew I'd made a mistake. God, I've gone off with a perfect stranger. I don't know who this guy is. And besides that, even though his car is better, I should have taken my car. I get on the loop, and I said, I'll buy a beer. I don't want a beer. God, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. I waited about 10 seconds. I said, I'm going to tell you something. You're either going to have to let me off top of the freeway. I want to walk over there at that 7-Eleven. Or you take me over there. I've got to have a beer and I've got to have one right now. I said, I got bad drunk last night. Besides that, it's 11.20. He said, can you wait till we get to the club? Oh, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> I can handle a total fight if I got a little light. So we drove and drove kind of a bad neighborhood. Drove up from this rickety looking house I said my god is this it he said yeah I thought well when I get some money I'll help these folks <laughs> walked in there and some of the deacons were sitting over there talking about women in the stock market and I found out later they didn't know anything about either one went back there in the back and the old bar had a hose in the linoleum I bet it was old linoleum when they put it on the bar and the bartender he didn't look a hell of a lot better than I did program of attraction you know and this little deacon said, mix him up a little milk and honey. I said, my God, what do you put in it? I never drank anything like that in my life. He said, well, you see, you're, used, you're nervous. I said, hell, that's what I've been trying to tell you. And he said, and besides all that, you're used to sugar in your system from alcohol, and the honey has already been digested. I said, indigestion is not my problem. If you throw up right, you don't have indigestion. I drank half of it, it curdled, came right back up. He said, don't worry about it, we have plenty. I thought, hell, I'm going to put on a show for these folks. One of the smart ones says, walk all you want to. Hell, I don't want to walk at all. I'm sitting there drinking that sweet, sweet stuff, walking back and forth. They're just looking in there, got a new animal in here today. Just laughing and talking and watching the animal walk up and down the floor. Finally, about 4.30, he says, I think it's time we went home. And I said, yeah. And I said, now let me out a couple of blocks before we get to the park, but I wanted to slip in there and get in my car and go get some bourbon. Because, you know, beer would not cut that sweet taste. He said, don't drink anything. I'm going to pick you up in an hour and a half. I said, what for? We're going to a meeting. I said, where? Right back where we came from. I said, my God, we was there all day. So he let me out, and I walked, and then here he comes, and back over there we go. Kind of a funny-looking bunch. I saw two or three of them kind of laughing and hugging. The rest of them, they didn't act like this too glad to be there either. They started out with a little prayer. Then some girl got up and talked two or three hours. They said it's 30 minutes, but I know it's longer than that. <laughs> and they would just laugh. What a damn thing funny. And then some guy got up and talked two or three hours. And they'd just laugh. I said, I'm going to tell you something. This is a sick bunch of people. <laughs> Then they all got up and said the Lord's Prayer for God's sakes. I thought, isn't that something? A bunch of people here saying the Lord's Prayer, they ain't got to be to say the Lord's Prayer. And then about that time, just as soon as they got through that Lord's Prayer, everybody started talking at the same time, nobody started listening. I said, I wonder how he did that. I'm going to keep my eyes open tomorrow night and see what he did. They didn't lay any hands. <clears throat> they didn't lay any hands on anybody, didn't do any kneeling or nothing or singing any songs. Me and the deacon were standing back there in the back. Nobody's speaking to us. And then I see the deal. 
men and women getting together, laughing, holding hands, jumping in cars, taking off. I said, uh oh. After you hear a little while, go to one of those apartments and have a little drink and talk about this damn thing. We went night after night after night after night and nobody invited us anywhere. I've got the only deacon that nobody likes. It doesn't rain in Houston, it just falls out. One night he's called, I said, man. He said, I'll pick you up in 30 minutes. I said, it's raining. Do you ever go get a drink when it's raining? I'll be ready. <laughs> one weekend, oh, what's her name? Number one. Had gone back to the valley. See if we had any friends left? So I just locked the door. Pulled down all the shades. Turned out all the lights. Had nothing on but the TV set. That old phone just ring, 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 let it ring. Next morning he called and said, where were you last night? I said, I was right here watching television. Enjoyed every damn minute of it. And I may do it again tonight. He said, well, you missed it. I said, what did I miss? He said, I don't know. I said, wasn't you there? He said, yeah, but I only heard what I was supposed to hear. We'll never know what it was you were supposed to hear. I thought, my God, you've got to go every night or you'll miss it. I went three months, got drunk, three months, got drunk, three months, got drunk, and I sobered up all by myself. And then I decided, I'm just really not an alcoholic. The only thing that's really wrong with me is I've just always been underfinanced. And if I can get properly financed, then I can tell them all to take it and shove it. And I've heard they've got heavy drinkers. I'm probably just a heavy drinker. Well, I knew first things first, I need to go back and officially resign. So I went back and the meeting had already started. Evidently, I'd called him one morning about 2.30 while drinking. I doubt it very seriously. I, I think they'll tell you any damn thing they want to tell you. So the meeting had already started. And as soon as the meeting was over, I was started. Here he comes. And I start towards him so I can resign and tell him thank you very much. He couldn't even wait for me to tell him. He said, don't you ever call me again. I said, God, I'm glad you said that. I never called you in the first place. And I'm going to tell you something your best friends will not tell you. Nobody likes you here. We don't ever get invited anywhere and they don't know me so it's got to be you. And I'm going to tell you another thing. If I had as bad a personality as you do, I'd go back to drinking. And you don't ever have to you look at me because it's the last time you're going to see me brother and I'm going to tell you something if you think I'm going to call you again you badly mistaken I wouldn't call you if you was the last human being on earth you have heard from me from your last time and I turned and left and he did till the next morning then I called him he said meet me at the club and I walked in the club and he said Get your coffee and sit down. They talk to you like a dog here, you know. So I'm going to tell you something about alcoholics, anonymous, al non, al teen, al tot, and al dog. <laughs> Absolutely no failure here. Never has, never will, impossible to, and cannot. There's no failure here. No way for it to fail. Not going to be any failure. Never has been, never will be. Provided you do exactly what we tell you to do the way that we tell you to do it. He said, now, there's only one thing that you're going to get to do. And this one thing, if you don't give an alcoholic a decision to make, they'll flounder on the same subject for years. <laughs> so we're going to give you a decision to make this morning. Now remember, this is the only thing that you're going to get to do. But you're the only one that's going to get to do it. You're going to get to decide whether you're going to go our way of life or your way of life. I said, I don't want to do either one. He said, I didn't ask you what you wanted to do. I asked you what you were going to do. I said, do you mean tell me you don't care and the group doesn't care whether I want to or not? He said, not a bit. I said, well, if you'll make it perfectly clear to the group that I don't want to do it, then I'll do it. <laughs> he said, well, first of all, we've got to get some things straight. It's your thinking that's wrong. I said, how much of my thinking is wrong? We always start with all of it. <laughs> and if there's any, any good, we'll let you know. I said, you put a sign up there on the wall that says, think, think, think. And he said, that's for us. <laughs> he said, now we're going to give you some things to do and some things not to do. The things we're going to give you not to do is going to change. We're going to give you to do just to add two. And then it's going to happen over here. 
I said, what's going to happen over there? We don't know, but it always happens. I said, I'm going to tell you something. I've been listening to you and listening to you. You've never listened to me. I have been listening to you. I listen to every word you got to tell me, and I want you to hear me. I do not understand. He said, and that's it, and don't you ever forget it. <laughs> that there's two things that you must remember the rest of your days. No matter what's going on in your life, you do not understand. Then you'll have understanding. And when you quit trying to understand, then you'll enjoy it. And the other thing is, no matter what your situation is, it's never the situation. It's never them. It's never God. It's never her. It's you that must become different. You must become different than you have ever been before. I said, how do I do that? He said, oh, you can't. What the hell you tell me for then? He said, that's what's going to happen to you. He said, now I'm going to give you the kicker. This is the very one thing that got you here. But it's also the very one thing that should it not change will be the very one thing that's going to keep you from getting all the things that God has for His children. As long as you know you know, you'll never know. But when you begin to do what we tell you not to do and to do, and begin to know that you don't know, then you'll begin to know. I said, hell, you're crazy. He said, I know. <laughs> so the first thing we're going to do, since you don't know how to not do anything, the first thing we're going to learn how to not do is drink or take a pill. He said, now, what you're going to do what that card that I gave you that has my number, my number and four other men, no women, on mine. When you get squirrely, definitely before you take a drink or a pill, no matter what time of day or night it is, you call one of those numbers. If you don't make the phone call, you didn't do it. That's what you're going to have to do to learn how to not do from now on. And make the phone call. Remember, if you don't make the phone call, you didn't do it. That's what we're going to do every day. When First thing in the morning, get down on your knees and say these words and these words only. God, take me today and do with me as you see fit. Let thy will only be done in my life and help me to definitely not take a drink of anything alcoholic or a mind-changing drug. Amen. Do not need to tell God what he has not done nor what he needs to do. God can handle that all by himself. And then call me before you go to the bathroom. I said, why before I go to the bathroom? You may not need to go. I said, do you mean to tell me that you don't think I've got sense enough to know when I need to go to the bathroom? He said, we'll find out. <laughs> they don't give you a lot of credit here, you know. Before I got down on my knees, I said, God, you and I know he don't know. Hell, he's a Presbyterian. But we're going to say and do everything just exactly like he says so we get enough this time, we can tell him to take it and shove it. Got down on my knees and said that the little prayer made sure I need to go to the bathroom, picked up the phone, called me. He didn't even ask where I need to go. And he said, go to the bathroom, meet me at the club. I made him the club and he said, now go to work. I said, I hate my job. He said, what's that got to do with it? I said, well, I hated it so much I couldn't go to work yesterday. He said, what would you do, sit in that chair and think? And I said, well, till noon then with the A club. He said, you don't know how to go to work. I said, how? He said, go get in the car. Write that down, we'll catch it. <clears throat> then he said, later on when we learn more, we'll do more. But right now, besides that little prayer you say of morning, and when you get in the car and get ready to go to work, just invite God in the day. I said, how do you do that? He says, God, I invite you in the day. Oh, put that on the card and we got it. <laughs> then you got to come back to AA Club, walk in, everybody's there, out loud they'll say, get your coffee and sit down. Hell, I know to get my coffee and sit down, but they've got to tell you. They've got to tell you out loud. The idiot doesn't have sense enough to know to get his coffee and sit down. <clears throat> then when you're almost cutting and you haven't figured out anything they're saying, and he says, out loud, it's time for you to go home and eat supper and come back to the meeting. Hell, I know to go home and eat supper and come back to the meeting. Then I come back and after the meeting, he says, now go home and get on your knees and thank God for the day. I do not thank God. They've been miserable damn day. Hate you, hate God, hate AA. And I'm not going to be a hypocrite. He said to me, you mean 
tell me that when you pray to God, you think you don't need it? And I said, that's right, and I'm not going to do it. He said, that has absolutely nothing to do with it. It's the action that you're taking that you don't know you're taking that's going to cause all the things to happen that you had no idea was going to happen. And once you take this action that you don't know you're taking, it's going to cause all these things to happen that you had no idea was going to happen. By the time all that happens, what you think needs to happen will never need to happen. Well, hell, I understood that for God's sake. I said, do you mean to tell me that God does not care when I pray to him whether I mean it or not? He said, not a bit. God is not going to depend on you at all for your relationship with him. He's going to take care of that all by himself. And I said, do you mean to tell me that you don't care when I pray to God and God doesn't care and the group doesn't care? He said, not at all. I just got in my car. Went home, locked the door so what's the name couldn't get in there. Got down on my knees. Okay, by God, God, thank you for a miserable damn day. Amen. <laughs> hell, if he don't care and they don't care and God don't care, hell, I don't care. <laughs> Did that for about two months. And one morning about 9.30, I didn't do anything any different that morning. And the other day, I'm driving down an old 610 loop right above Memorial Drive in Houston. And this guy that I had never known as my friend moved into that car with me. And for the first time in my life, I knew I knew something different than I'd ever known it before. I knew I knew I would never need to take another drink of anything alcoholic or a mind-changing drug as long as I lived unless I myself insisted upon it and I knew I knew it God he stayed with me all that day I thought man the rest of my life is going to be just like this I thought that afternoon I said you know what I may get me a tent some tambourines <laughs> old Oral better look out Jimmy is coming I'm going to go save some souls I might even let him go by and put up the tent God I couldn't wait to get back to that club he's ten minutes late walks to that door Get your coffee and sit down. The Baptist is taking over. Well, they don't like it too well coming back at him, but he did it. And I got him back in that other place, and I got him there, and I set him down there where I could look at him. And I told him the deal. And then I waited for him to make me the leader. I knew I was it. God had chosen me. He grinned just a little and said, Thank God we've got that over with. Now we can get started. <laughs> I said, my God, that took a year. He said, some are sicker than others. <laughs> I said, what are you going to do about old what's name? He said, uh, my marriage, we're just going to leave it like it is. I want to send you to a guy that's got his all worked out. Send me to an Episcopalian. You know they don't know. <laughs> this guy said, are you still married? And I said, not really. Uh, I just stay there and she stays there, but we don't stay together. No sex, nothing involved. There's a new gal that I know the Lord has sent for me, and she's there. She's been sober almost a month, and uh, <laughs> they won't let me go with her. He said, do you remember when you got in now, Alcoholics Anonymous? You didn't fit in, AA, and you didn't fit back out there, and you were kind of lonesome and thought you were the only one going through that lonesome period? And I said, yeah. He said, if you're willing to go through that lonesome period in every area of your life, I'll not only guarantee a relationship with a woman, I'll guarantee a relationship with men and women you could never believe. And I'll give you a bonus on top of that. I'll guarantee you a relationship with Almighty God that you could never dream of. I said, I don't believe that. He said, isn't that wonderful? You don't have to. I said, what do you mean? It's the action. I said, I've already heard that. He said, S you're still married to what's your name? I said, yep, legally, but not really. So I've been praying for somebody to sleep with and nobody will. <laughs> he said, okay, we'll practice on her. Since you don't know, you've got to become different to live with anybody and live with other people, so we'll just start and practice with her. You're never going to tell her what's wrong with her ever again. I said, who's going to tell her? <laughs> he said, I don't know, but you're not. And you're never going to do anything to get out and on, friends, children, or anything to work her around to get her to do what you want her to do. I said, never. He said, never. 
And you're going to pray for it. I said, no, I'm not. You pray for it. He said, now I want you to learn this prayer because you're going to say it for the rest of your days about all different relationships. Say this prayer and learn it. And you may have to say it a hundred times a day in the beginning. God, thy will be done for her as well as for me. Take our relationship. Let it become what you want it to be and show me the truth. I said, I do not want God's will to be done for her as well as for me. He said, remember, what you want has nothing to do with it. So I started that prayer and said it all day long, every day. Then about two or three months later, that old sex, love, lust thing surfaced, and I didn't even know I had it. Now I knew what it was, and I had it. Could not get rid of it. Told the sponsor over and over and over again, every day, every day, and God would not remove it. So I told the group. One of the girls said, you're not supposed to tell that in the group. So I went over and told another group. And one of them snitched on me. You know, we don't gossip here. We're just concerned. So he said, listen, we're, usually when you stop acting on any defect of character, God will transform your mind just like he did the alcohol and the drugs, and he'll transform your mind and remove it. That's not happening to you. Evidently, this is different. Once your name's gone back to the valley, you go over there, lock yourself in that apartment, and you and God, some way, deal with this thing. I went out and prayed and prayed and cried and cussed all day long, and about 11, 12 o'clock at night I went to sleep. Next morning, that thing was gone. I thought, God, they were so smart, I didn't even tell them. Finally, at the fourth meeting, we were over eating ice cream, and I said, well, I guess I might as well tell you all this. They said, oh, we knew it the first night. I said, why didn't you tell me? He said, you need to know that you're going to always be the last to know. I said, why is that? He said, we don't know. <laughs> and I told him, I said, why isn't she going to Al-Nan? If there's any al here, I want you to know I love you, love you. I really do love you. If you ever need anything, call me. They, they took her to you, and she found you depressing. And the more they took her, the more she found you depressing. So whatever you're doing, keep doing it. <laughs> so I ended up getting a divorce. When, we, when I had nothing and she had nothing, we had nothing. If you want to get sick, make something out of nothing. And then I married me a civilian Religious, Southern, Southern, real, Southern, Southern, Baptist, and finally speaking in tongues and stuff. And of course, I hadn't spoken in tongues since I quit drinking. But uh, <laughs> and we were both in screaming marriages, so it looked like it's going to be fine. And then, of course, we just grew apart. Where else always says we grew together, we grew apart. And now I'm married to somebody where it won't work, and it's beautiful. Uh, finally, married one that. I would never be seen with. Wouldn't be anybody that you'd ever picture me being with. So I told him I wasn't going to do it again because I was too young. She was never going to marry again because of her bad marriage. And uh, so we were safe running around together. Which, you know, the way I think, that's the way it works. And uh, my aunt told me, my badgest aunt said, the most ever woman is younger than you are now. I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> which I thought wasn't too nice, but... It was right. She's a Catholic. I'm a Baptist. She's a Yankee. And I'm definitely not Yankee. In fact, I always was concerned when I got north of the Red River in Oklahoma. <laughs> <clears throat> and she's al -Anon, And that's probably the thing that helped us. So at least I've got one Catholic that's not Catholic anymore. Catholics do not like their people marrying Baptists. They do not like it. And that's too bad. God, wouldn't you hate them? And I've got the marriage today that has all the freedom and goodness. I even want to go back home. I never did do that before. And we really have had a great last six years and looking forward to more. God, wouldn't you hate to miss it? What if we'd have missed it? What if we had missed it? God. You know what we've got today? I guess it's good we don't know it. I guess it's good we don't know what we have. I guess we did, we screwed up. We got something that people spend millions of dollars, thousands of dollars to get. Can't get it. We just can't get it. And we've got it. We got it and wasn't even looking for it. Isn't that amazing? We fell into it. Do you know what you're doing out there all the time? Exactly what you're supposed to do. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Beat yourself to death doing what you're supposed to do. 
<laughs> no, no, it's exactly what you're supposed to do. Get out there and get drunk, have car wrecks, have fights, and all that kind of stuff. Get in jail and raise hell and talk to lawyers and judges. Or get some of the judges in here. <laughs> but isn't that amazing that we got, we're it. We're in the deal. I don't know about other people. They don't tell me. They don't talk to me. But I know about you and I. I know what happened to us. Without a shadow of a doubt. We had to be. If anybody ever knew they were God's chosen people, it's you and I. Maybe you chose them all, I don't know. I don't know anything about other people. But I know I know things about you and I. He chose us. When, I don't know. Whether it was before we was born or afterwards, I don't know. All I know is, you and I did everything we were supposed to do. We did everything to prove ourselves insufficient. And to know God, you cannot be sufficient. And you and I gave it everything we had. You and I did everything we could do to destroy ourselves and couldn't do it. Anybody that would go with us, we were willing to destroy them too. Which they can be grateful for if they stayed. Because they didn't get in now long. Otherwise, they, if they quit too quick, they won't make it. Isn't that amazing where God put us? And it's the thing that He's got us in, we can't brag about it or nothing. Because you didn't know where you was going. How are you going to brag about saying, I went out there to get properly prepared so God could take me and do with me what He wanted to do? Did you know that's what you was doing? No, you thought you was out there having children, trying to have life, become something. What are you going to do it? I remember the Baptists used to say, you know, I'm only, I'm nothing but filthy rags. See, you and I did that. We experienced being a filthy rag. And experiencing it. Oh, Swaggart proved it to us. <laughs> Hell, if I'd known he was having that trouble, we could have taken my car. <laughs> you know, they wouldn't have thought anything about it when Swaggart did his deal. God, he helped me. God. He used to make fun of us, you know. He helped me. God, he helped me. Because my second wife got into all that stuff. And God, he helped me. See, he preached to repent, but he didn't do it. He's sitting there with that old sex deal I had. He didn't even get to do it, for God's sakes. Riding around with a girl reading magazines. Isn't that pitiful? Pay to talk to us. We could have let him at least have one weekend. God, shame. But see, he proved it to us. He proved everything for us. He did it. Here's a guy that had all the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He had all the interpretations that God gave him from the Bible. God used him to lay the hands on the people. He used him to shoot those demons out there, however they do that. I don't know. But he did. And he got all those people in there, used him with that charisma that he's got to bring them all in. Did him. He had it all. What did he do? That, that, that one thing that we got. And we've got it. He admitted to God himself. And you and I see what we've got. He didn't do it. And we've got it. God gave it to us. And what is that? We admit it to God, ourselves, and what? Another human being. And that's it. That's the one thing. Bye. (laughs) Isn't that wonderful? That you and I are in the place that Almighty God designed that old stuff he used to say, he said, I'll prepare a place for you. He did. Were you all here? Yeah. When? When I got ready. Did you know he was ready? No. I just found out I was ready after I was ready. <laughs> you know he was getting to where you were? No. Did you know you need to go where you were? No. Get there? Yeah, did. When? I don't know. Just whenever it was. Well, then that was the right time. And see, we're right on time. We're not late. We're not early. We're right on the button. Everything that's happened to you and I up to this moment was absolutely necessary because what? Because God said it was. Not because I said it was, or you said it was, or anybody said it was. See, that's the reason professionals can't do anything with us. See, we're going to the top dog, God himself, in my life. 
I go to no other human being for my life. Because see, with God, I can become what He wants me to be, not knowing what that is, nor how it's to be done, nor when or the way it's to be done, nor what my path is going to be. But you see, you and I have a path to go down. Nobody goes down there but you and I. I'm going to go down that path. I'm going to get some plaque on the way. But if I won't get off of that path, then God's going to transform me into exactly His image, as He says. And He's going to use me to do whatever it is that He wants done. And the majority of the time, I'm not going to know what that is. So you and I have the edge today. You and I have the edge wherever we go. Because we're going to get some plaque. And we're going to get the stuff that the world does. Because the worldly way is not our way. But what did God say? God say, His people do not fit in the world. So you and I did exactly what we were supposed to do. We tried to fit, but couldn't. Because God's people don't fit here. He said, I'll create a kingdom just for my people. And He did. And we're here. And we're in it. And once I'm in that kingdom then I get to live in the only power that overcomes everything. Every situation and everything. And I live in that power today just like you. And that power never, never fails us. When you and I call one another, when you and I meet together, when you and I invite this God into our life that day, that power and that God walks with us every day, every moment of every day just like it has been here this weekend. What a beautiful weekend we've had here today, being able to be with you and me be with you and see that power never fails. Thank God I stayed with you long enough to feel that God loving me that day. But the difference was you. My life was never to be any different until God sent me to be with you and you to be with me. And it didn't fail us here, just like it is right now when I can feel you loving me and me loving you. Thank you very much.